Excellent. All right, well, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, and I, I was given the task of uh, kind of scoping exactly what the problem is, the degree to which this is a problem, talk about some of the drivers, why, what got us here, uh, talk a little bit about the harm, and, uh, and more broadly, the scope of the issues. Okay, so uh, before I get, uh, get started, I do want to say that this is perceived as a huge issue. Not long ago, we did a study where we, uh, we did a survey of the international stem cell community. These are both scientists and, uh, and LC people, ethical, legal, and social scholars. And we were asking them, what's becoming a big issue in the context of stem cells? Well, no surprise, it used to be, everyone in the room knows this, uh, embryonic stem cells, cloning, that kind of stuff, right? No surprise, over the last few years, all the issues have been about translation. Makes total sense. There's real, this real move towards translation issues, things like patenting, things like regulation, uh, things like who, your consent and who owns these cells. But the number one issue, as perceived by the stem cell community, the marketing and selling of unproven uh, stem cell therapy. So this is a big issue. This meeting's important. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Okay, so what is the problem? Uh, we've already heard from Alta and from John, two fantastic talks, uh, sort of the, a sense of what the problems are. Now, if you are, I did the same thing as Alta, and Jen is it Jennifer? <laughs> Jennifer. Uh, if you are a, a, a desperate patient, as John pointed out, you, and you Google stem cell therapy, this is what you get, right? You get taken to a bunch of clinics that look incredibly legitimate, some of them more so than others that are offering treatments for virtually everything. And I'll go through this quickly because the last two speakers have, have, have mentioned it. But I do think it's worth highlighting, once again, the, the scope of the issues, the number of issues that they allegedly have stem cell therapies for. Uh, some of these clinics have, have so many that they've got to, you know, put it in alphabetic order, right? They can cure virtually everything. And, of course, they always can cure aging, which, is you'll see, comes up over and over again, um, which is good, as i turning 50 right away. Um, <laughs> And uh, here's one of the M cells, a uh, clinic from Ukraine, very well known. Again, another list of the therapies they can cure. They can cure oncology, which is an interesting disease. They can cure uh, <laughs> um, diabetes. You got it, right? And, a and aging problems again. Over and over again, you see these uh, therapies. I put up this one because this one, John, is one, another one of the clinics that has a base, it seems to be, in the U.S. Again, look at, look at the, the treatments that they can cure. Like, it's virtually everything, right? Uh, and this, ag again, is a mar marker, and I don't mind using this word in this context. This is a marker of quackery, right? When you have a therapy that alleg allegedly can cure anything. Uh, now, Alta talked about this, too, and I think it's, it seems frivolous and fun, but it's important to put up. It's important to remind ourselves of this, because this is the breadth. This is cultural phenomenon, right? Stem cells now really is a term that has cultural traction uh, and therefore influences how people perceive these websites. So I think it's very important. Um, th this uh, person needs an editor, but I'll read it anyway. Stem cells, skin therapies are one of the most major medical breakthroughs in history and are being widely used. They, this sentence is confuses so many things not only grammar, but, um, uh, uh, but it confuses, you know, it's being, c cures cancer and it is skin cell therapies. It's ridiculous, right? But you see these kinds of, this kinds of, these kinds of languages. Again, I call it science ploitation. And this is a phenomenon that has happened for centuries, really. It happened with electricity. It happened with magnetism. It happened with radioactivity, right? They were selling radium water. Anytime there was a scientific intervention Scientific development that is exciting and sexy, people use it to, uh, to profit. Uh, and this, uh, we're doing actually looking at, at the uh, cosmetic industry, which is fascinating. It's become so, so common now that they give out awards for the best stem cell cream, right? Now, I love the middle one um, because it, it, it merges organic with stem cells, right? So you have both the organic universe and stem cell. You just need some nano and genetics in there, and you've got the whole, <laughs> whole bag. But this is, again, it's fun it's to look at the stuff, but very important because it, it colors how I think the population views this entire field. Okay, so what, what is going on? This is what my, uh, how, how are these, these, these uh, treatments being offered? Now, we did a study in 2008 uh, that was published in Cell Stem Cell where we tried to look at this in a very systematic manner. So what we did is we looked at, um, we kind of pretended we were, we were a patient trying to find uh, therapies. And what we found was uh, all these clinics, and then we very systematically coded um, how 
the information is provided. In addition to that, on this paper, we involved some uh, technology transfer uh, experts who then have went and evaluated uh, in a systematic manner whether there was any evidence to support what was being offered. And what did we find? No surprise, everyone in the room knows this. We found that the treatments are being offered as routine, they're being offered as efficacious, and they're being offered as extremely low risk. All right? And there was no mapping onto the uh, clinical evidence as our uh, tech transfer people, or technology assessment people found. So really, uh, a worst case scenario, uh, and these are, for, these are for the treatments for serious diseases. Now we just redid that study. Uh, it was published um, just a couple months ago, so I have a proof up here, actually. I should have had the more recent one. Uh, we were thinking, you know, as we're going to hear out through the day, that given all the attention that stem cell tourism has received, that maybe the situation has gotten better. You know, maybe uh, the clinics, at, at a minimum, I think it's even through discussions with you, Doug, we thought they might be shifting their tactics, saying these are experimental treatments, and, and that, that was, you know, one of our hypotheses. In fact, it wasn't the case at all. They haven't changed their language. They are just as bold as in the past, in some respects worse, right? In some respects worse. So they're saying these are efficacious, they're saying that they're routine, and they're saying that they're low risk. So it hasn't got any better over the five-year period. And of course, even when there is some kind of regulatory action, what we found, and, and this was, we weren't studying this, you guys, so we didn't do this in a systematic manner, so this is more anecdotal, but we, what we did find was uh, a clinic would shut down and would just open up someplace else, or there, there, all, or there is some interesting movement. So, so it's not getting any better, uh, and they're offering all these, these treatments. Now, it is a global phenomenon, which makes it, from a regulatory perspective, tremendously difficult. Uh, what are the numbers? It's very, uh, again, people in this room know, that, know this, it, it's very difficult to get a sense of what's going on here, right? Exact numbers. It's because it is an internet, uh, largely an internet-based uh, industry, uh, it's, a lot of these companies are, are in jurisdictions where it's hard to get, um, uh, get access to them. So it's very difficult to know exactly how many patients there are, exactly how big the market is, and exactly um, um, how many patients uh, are, are how, how many patients are going to these clinics. Uh, so here's some speculation that, I, that I've found. By the way, I ask all, a lot of my colleagues, I, before, right before this meeting, also I email my colleagues, give me, tell me what you think, what you know. Well, here's one piece. You know, they, they estimated it's at a billion. I think this was in the Stanford uh, magazine, a uh, billion dollar industry. Um, th this is a, a piece that came out from a colleague, Edna Einsiedel. She says over 700 clinics that they were able to match. Now, that was a map. That was a little bit more of a rigorous uh, take on it. So this is big stuff, bottom line. Uh, these, uh, uh, another thing that you can do is you can look at what the clinics are claiming. Now, again, is this true or is it not? They might be playing it both sides, right? One way they want to look like they have a lot of patients, and the other side maybe they don't look like they have a lot of patients. But this is one claim from, I think this is Bakey, which is in China. Between uh, 2005 and 2009, they claim to have seen over 5,000 patients, right? Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but it gives you a sense, right? Uh, and by the way, that's just for their the disease-based treatments, not some of the other things that they do. So if you believe it, the numbers are big. Uh, this is uh, a well-known paper uh, by the Hopkins group, by Deborah Matthews' team, clinics all over the place. This was a study that we did. Now, this was media representations, you guys. So this is not actual counting numbers, but it, again, gives you a sense of where these clinics are. China uh, dominates, um, and China, India, now India, should that should probably be a bigger slice of the pie because I think increasingly that's where a lot of the clinics are. Germany is probably bigger than it ought to be because that was one clinic that got a lot of attention. But, but it gives you a sense where these, these clinics are all over the world. The other thing that we found was uh, get th our studies also gives you a sense of who's going there. You can see that a lot of men are going, which is interesting because that's different from complementary alternative medicine. But the th scary number is the number of, of kids that are going, right? Forty. Uh, again, keep in mind, these are this is media coverage. Nevertheless, it's clear that a lot of, a lot of kids are going here. So people say, what's the big deal? What's the potential harm? First of all, there is real harm, as this has been found. If you're putting stem cells into human beings, if they are real stem cells, uh, th there, are, there are problems, including tumor, tumor growth. There have been deaths associated with the delivery of these treatments. Uh, one of the best known is the one in Germany. 
Uh, there has been this well-known story about bone fragments growing in a, in a woman's eye after she had the cosmetic procedure put on her face. So there's real harm. There's, of course, financial harm. There's the public trust issues that, that happen to the field uh, more broadly. Uh, I'm going to come back to the financial harm one because I think this is significant. Now, this is what we found, somewhere between 20,000 to 50,000 per treatment, you guys, per treatment. So if you're going for a number of treatments, you're flying to China, the cost can be significant. Uh, and the other issue is, and, and John touched on this, is on the uh, clinical trial regulatory process. This creates real challenges, uh, and that's one of the goals for today, uh, for the whole field. Uh, and uh, I, I think this is an also another harm of, the, uh, of, of this area. Okay, so what are the drivers? What got us here? Uh, well, I, I, I think we can't underestimate the role of hype uh, uh, on this area. What made stem cells a sexy, exciting phrase is the hype, right? It is, uh, you know, when you see headlines like this, cancer and stem cells, uh, you know, that it could save your life, uh, it becomes very legitimate, right? And it becomes a term that's easy to exploit. When you hear that, you know, stem cells can treat diabetes, and that's an old headline, by the way, you guys. Um, when you see that Peyton Manning, one of my favorite athletes there, get, he got him. It's good enough for Peyton. It's good enough for me. You see those kinds of headlines. It be becomes real, and it seems possible. Now, we've actually studied the tone of, of, of the how. So these, these is a study of how the popular press actually represents these clinics and these kinds of treatments. And the results for us were, were st uh, shocking. It's almost without exception positive. So the blue is positive, the, the negative is the green. You can see it's overwhelmingly positive. These clinics are portrayed in a positive light. Uh, there's that one dip there, and that's when the ISSCR came out with their guidelines, uh, but it quickly bounces back up the next year. Very, very positive. Um, now, there have been a couple high-profile stories. There was a CNN profile. There was one, that, a, a nice piece that was in the New York Times very recently. But in general, entirely positive. Uh, here's examples of the kind of stories. These are generally human interest stories. So if you have a, de a desperate kid, right, John, and you see one of these headlines and one of these stories, it be seems very real and very tangible, like a real possibility. You know, Dakota was blind, but now the three-year-old can see, right? Here's uh, a, another one of my favorite examples. It's um, a story from the, new, uh, from the Toronto Star. And what's so aggravating about this, and we found this in a third of the articles, they actually tell people where they can send money. You know, so here we have the Toronto Star, a very respected paper in Canada, um, telling people where to send money to send this person to get a treatment that's probably bogus, right? Uh, and this is the most heartbreaking one for me. This was just last year, east coast uh, of Canada. They have a group of students raise, doing a penny drive to raise money to send a kid to China to get treat, a, blind, a blind student, a blind colleague blind classmate to get a treatment. And here's some quotes from the kid. I just can't wait to see the sun and the, color, the colors and trees. Uh, they had almost raised enough money and they were holding a dance that night to try to raise the rest. I mean, it's really, really heartbreaking stuff. Um, uh, the other phenomenon that, that is happening, uh, in, increasingly so, and this is something that we're watching, is, is the sports issue. Now, what's, why we find this interesting, you guys, and um, Doug, I don't know if you've noticed this, it's even more uncritical in this, in this area. Uh, they, you're seeing it increasingly, and this, I think it's targeting a very particular demographic, you know, rich, rich individuals that are, are very active, you know, they're sports, sporty, older gentlemen, perhaps, <laughs> and these companies are advertising for that demographic, and it's a very, very uncritical portrayal uh, of stem cells. It's almost always portrayed as being totally uh, efficacious. Now, uh, I don't want to get into this because this is more of, of what uh, uh, Peter's going to talk about, but um, we, we have also tried to get a sense of why people are going there. One of the things my colleagues did, uh, one of my colleagues, Kristen Rachel, did a very cool analysis of patients blogging. Now, we know we know this is, has got some methodological problems because it's uh, you know, not, uh, clearly a biased sample and, and who blogs, right? And there's also some hints that maybe the clinics are blogging, right? So we don't know. But still very interesting th themes that John talked about already. People are going here because they feel like they have no choice, right? That China's given them hope uh, that they're going to die anyway. But the one I want to highlight is this one, is that they, people view themselves as pioneers, right? And that they're angry at their, their, jur their home jurisdiction for having those burdensome regulator regulatory rules. They're angry and they feel that they must put themselves in harm's way in order to get a treatment that ought to be available in, in their home jurisdiction. Um, so the last thing I want to end with, and this builds really nicely on some of the stuff that, that John was talking about, 
We just finished an analysis of over 175 websites from scientific societies, from um, stem cell research groups, and from patient disease societies, looking at how they try to educate their community, their population, about stem cell tourism. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people are trying to do a good job, uh, but what we found was missing, um, and I'm going to go right to it, is they rarely, look how few actually define stem cell tourism, uh, how few talk about evidence, uh, how few talk about risk, and how few talk about what, what the patients should look for. And the other thing that, that, we, that was missing is that uh, it, there was a lack of explanation um, about the regulatory process, and we think that's something that needs to be communicated, why that regulatory process is there and why it's valuable. Uh, and that hopefully also is the kind of thing that might flow from a meeting like this. So the last thing I want to say is that, um, that I think that this whole area is going to become even more challenging as we get closer to the clinic. There is this big push to the clinics, and as, as John has pointed out, what's going to happen when we have treatments like what John's doing that are starting to emerge all over the world? It becomes a lot more difficult for regulators to say, this is fraud, this is bogus, when you have things that may be in clinical trial, they're looking promising, and some other jurisdiction is, is offering it. So we got to get this right now uh, in order to uh, deal with the issues in the future. So I'll end there and say thank you very, very much. Thank you. <clears throat> well, moving right along, we have Alan Peterson from Monash University, and we're looking forward to a, a perspective from down under. We're picking up a lot today already. Thank you. <clears throat> 